in to the second episode of Computer Says No in my series on stack-based buffer overflow exploitation. So, depending on your current understanding um, of these uh, bugs, um, this video series may serve as an introduction or a refresher. Or if you're way ahead of the class and you know this stuff but you're watching the video uh, for some reason anyway, um, you may want to skip ahead or you may want to stick around to uh, pick everything I say apart and uh, leave some comments uh, schooling uh, me on what's going on. But either way, what I'm going to be doing in this video is taking a look at how the bug works and how it's leveraged by attackers. So for now, I think a short explanation will suffice. Uh, when a program writes more data to a buffer than that buffer was specified to hold, the data overflows its boundaries and into adjacent areas of the stack, and it corrupts neighboring data. This is what um, a stack buffer overflow is. But for now, um, let's talk a little bit more about the stack. So, what is the stack? Well, this is the stack on screen. Well, it's a stack. It's a stack of plates. Uh, but the stack that we are concerned about is a data structure in memory. Um, it's called uh, the stack. Um, it's considered a linear data structure um, or a sequential collection, and it operates um, in a FILO fashion. That's F-I-L-O, first in, last out. So imagine you are stacking plates, one on top of another, like you see in this photo, and uh, you go to take a plate off the stack um, the plate that you do take off the stack would be the last plate that you had put onto the stack. So plate stacking um, in the kitchen works in the you know same sense that uh, the stack in computing does, in that it's a follow principle. In computing, though, the process of uh, putting on and taking off data from the stack is referred to as pushing and popping. Um, so something is pushed onto the stack. Um, and is popped off the stack. So the assembly instructions that perform these operations on the stack are aptly named push and pop, and you'll hear more and more about these as you uh, continue your studying um, of binary exploitation. So now let's take a look at a slide. So over to the first slide of the series, and you are looking at a graphical representation of a stack frame. But before we go into the stack frame business too much, we'll uh, take a look at some CPU registers, um, talk about them, uh, the ones that are relevant uh, to the stack when exploiting these kinds of bugs. So you'll be monitoring, monitoring uh, CPU registers in Immunity Debugger as you craft your exploits um, and aiming to get data inside of them. So the ones on the screen are the ones that you really have to know, and that is ESP, Extended Stack Pointer, EBP, extended base pointer, and EIP, the extended instruction pointer. Uh, yeah, the EBP is the base pointer. Uh, it's also referred to as the frame pointer, and it is used to reference function parameters and variables on the current stack frame. EBP points to the base of or the higher memory address region of the stack. On the other hand, we have ESP pointing to the top of the stack. So yeah, that's the stack pointer pointing to the top of the stack, or the last element uh, that was placed onto the stack, and that's at the lower memory address range, okay? Uh, EIP, it's the extended instruction pointer, um, and it holds the address of the next CPU instruction that is to be executed, okay? So the first item that we push onto the stack, um, it will reside at a high memory address down here where the um, XFFF is, and every time uh, we push an item onto the stack thereafter that first one, it'll have a lower memory address, um, decrementing in value usually by four bytes. So with every item that we push onto the stack, we see ESP, uh, we see the ESP value decrement. Um, this is why the stack is often spoke of, uh, spoken of rather as growing backwards. All right, uh, yeah, okay, so but what is a stack frame? Well. It's often referred to uh, also as an activation record and it just uh, essentially contains data relating to a function call. So local variables within a function, function parameters, and return address, this sort of thing. Um, when we're in a stack frame and a function is proceeding through its execution uh, and does what it was intended to do, all the data in its frame is popped off of the stack bit by bit, variable by variable, and eventually we arrive at EIP. Now EIP, the instruction pointer, if you remember, holds the address of the next CPU instruction to be executed. 
Normally ERP contains a return address from the calling function or code saying, hey, once you've completed this function, come back to me and proceed with the next bit of code. So this value, the return address pointer, um, is placed into EIP when the stack frame was set up. This happens during a call instruction uh, when we entered the function uh, in question. So the stack frame gets sort of cleaned up and execution returns to some other function or to the main function thanks to the return value in EIP. This was how everything is intended to work. Now EIP is crucial to exploitation um, of these stack-based buffer overflow bugs. It's what we need to be able to write to uh, to control the flow of the program. On to slide two. Okay, we're here in slide two. And with that initial theory, uh, with the registers and the stack frame out of the way, let's take a look at how this bug is actually a problem. So at the top of our stack, stack you see a buffer variable. Let's say it's 120 bytes, uh, it's 120 bytes were allocated to store data inside of this buffer or array. Um, in the event that no bounds checking is ever done in the code by the software developer when using unsafe function calls from the C programming language such as string copy, a larger amount of data um, that was intent then a larger amount of data then uh, was intended could easily be supplied as input to our program um, that and can overflow our buffer, right? <clears throat> So what happens when we you know, do supply 220 bytes of data instead of the intended maximum of 120? Well, as you can see on this current slide, our buffer is full to the brim with A's and is also overflown into EBP and EIP. Um, this will cause a segmentation fault and you know, you're looking at like a graphic theoretically of uh, a buffer overflow. That's what had happened. We would... Um, crash the program, a seg fault happens because when the function runs its course and eventually looks to return to the calling function, uh, there is no return address there. It has been overwritten with A's. Uh, the repeated A's aren't a valid memory address, so the program will crash and burn. Let's have a look at slide three. Okay, we're in slide three. Um, interesting stuff so far, but how is this bug actually leverage so we can gain code execution. Well, EIP or the extended instruction pointer uh, is meant to contain a return address, right? We spoke about that before. Or more or more technically speaking, it points to the next instruction that is to be executed. So if we can get our own code into memory at some other place and point EIP at the address of that some other place, then we can get our code to execute. And this is exactly how exploitation of these bugs happens, right? Initially, we need to determine how many bytes uh, the buffer contains until um, it is overflown. This is often referred to as finding the offset. So once we determine the offset, hypothetically, if it's 100 bytes, then we know that the next four bytes uh, that we write into the buffer will end up in EIP. And um, thus we can, you know, uh, control the execution flow of the program. So uh, we will look at determining um, where EIP should point to um, and, and how to go about finding that location later in this series. But for now on this graphic, you can see if we did find out just how many A's we need to um, fill up these buffers with, then we could certainly squeeze in uh, you, you know, uh, a memory address to write to EIP. So that's exactly what we'll be doing later. But let's have a look at slide four. All right, in uh, slide four, <coughs> we can see here that an informed attacker has not only sent hundreds of A's into our program, they have also sent in uh, a memory address, this hex value, and they have overwritten EIP with that, just like in the previous slide. Um, and following the EIP uh, being overwritten though, they've also sent in some shell code uh, with a bunch of no operations uh, prior, uh, previous to the, the shellcode. Um, if I didn't know any better, I'd say it's Meterpreter reverse shellcode. What do you think? Just at a glance, you know? Uh, so what happens now that they've overflown the buffer with all this extra stuff? Well, this is how it would go. Um, and it would be observed in the debugger that ESP, the stack pointer, it is pointing to a spot in memory um, that holds this NOP sled and this shellcode, okay? So let's have a look at how the program executes. Now we've got uh, 
an instruction that we want in ERP. So we're gonna tell uh, tell the program where to go by having overwritten ERP. And we've also managed to squeeze our shell code into some other space that ESP points to. Well, the program will move through the buffer of A's uh, in, in the buffer and in EBP, it'll get to EIP where EIP now contains a memory address of a jump ESP instruction. The program will indeed uh, jump to ESP. So we'll jump up to ESP uh, and we see that ESP is pointing to an, a area, an area rather in memory that contains an op slot in our shell code. So ESP goes to that in, uh, memory address and then that code executes. We slide through the nops and hit the shell code and then boom, we've got a shell. There you go, the victim got owned. Uh, so that's all good and well. Let's quickly take a look at the actual source code before we finish this video, okay? And um, yeah, we'll see where the vulnerability lies within that code. I think that will be beneficial. So I'll see you in the source code. Okay, over in uh, VS Code, having a look at the C file. Um, yeah, this is Justin Stevens code uh, from his do stack buffer overflow good repository. Um, so what's going on in this code? Well, basically here in the main, uh, we're just setting up sockets. Uh, then we loop eventually awaiting for a new connection. So all of this stuff here, uh, creating sockets that uh, set up listing sockets, and, no, 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 no. and we get to a while loop, all right? Um, so, we see down here on line 78 that a new thread is being created for each connection in which uh, yeah, handle connection um, is being executed. Um, this function basically reads data being sent into the program by uh, a client or a user and responds with a message if the data that it receives ends with a new line character. Okay, uh, Handle connection responds using a function called do response in which um, sprintf uh, builds a response string combining the user input um, and uh, prepending the word hello and uh, appending some exclamation marks onto the string, sort of forming a new string. So down the bottom here is the definition of the do response um, function. So we see uh, it's taking a client name um, as input and it uses sprintf to um, stick the client name in the middle in between this hello and exclamation marks and it builds that new string and then it stores um, the string in the response array um, or buffer uh, and as you can see only 128 bytes were allocated and there's no bounds checking um, done there so here lay the vulnerability um, if a user sends in a large name uh, a, a big long string, then the data overflows into the stack. And that is about that, it's that simple. So hopefully you can see what's going on here um, because that's all I've got for this video. Although, you know, if things aren't that clear, I'd say stick around for the series anyway. You'll see me go over things step by step and hopefully um, you can get it by the end of the series if you don't already. So uh, I'll see you in the next one.